Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone, uh, depending on where you are. And welcome to the ISC Africa Regional Webinar, COVID-19 pandemic and its implications for the African commons. We will be uh, on this web webinar for an hour. Uh, and uh, we also would like to mention the fact that ISC is organizing a number of other webinar events uh, running from the 13th to the 27th of July, 2020. And uh, we will be sharing a lot of information on this in the chat box uh, in terms of if you want to get in touch or participate in some of the coming uh, events. Maybe before we begin, I just wanted to acknowledge, I think uh, people who have helped us organize this uh, webinar. I would want to thank uh, Marco Janssen, who is, the who is a professor at the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University, and also the president for the ISC. I would also want to uh, Thank Kofi Arinon, who is a researcher at the Center for International Cooperation in Agricultural Research for Development, uh, in short, which is called CIRAD. Uh, he, he has been helping us with the French version of uh, the webinar series that we'll be running. And uh, within the ISC, I would also want to thank uh, Karen, who is the ISC Executive Director. Uh, she has been helping us uh, with several logistical arrangements. And Luz Andrea, who has been doing a lot of our web, uh, website design and management. Maybe before we start, just to get an idea of how we are going to uh, structure this uh, webinar series, uh, we will have five minute statement by each panelist. At the moment, we have uh, three of the panelists have already joined us and we're expecting the fourth to join uh, in the next uh, coming minutes. After that, I will ask uh, a few questions uh, to the panelists. And then I'll also collect questions from the participants to ask the panelists. And uh, also just to mention that uh, uh, as one of our panel members would say that uh, it's good that at least this is not a men only panel. And, uh, but uh, Ruth, I promise that maybe in the next one we even have more women in the panel as well, so that at least we can have 50-50. And uh, we also, so we encourage all the uh, participants to also submit questions uh, in Q&A. And, &A. and uh, participants are all automatically muted and this webinar is being recorded and will also be shared uh, on the ISC website. For other information, uh, we are encouraging people to join the ISC and uh, we'll be providing the information in the chat uh, so that we focus more uh, on the panelists uh, and the discussions that we're going to be making. The panelists that I have today, uh, the first one is uh, Dr. James Murombezi, is the Chief of African Climate Policy Center at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, uh, UNECA in Ethiopia, based in Ethiopia. And uh, what we're doing, uh, we actually, our, our panelists have quite a long CV. So what we are also doing, will be providing links to the panelists' uh, full CVs so that you can uh, maybe, uh, if you want to uh, know more better about our panelists, you can do that. We also have um, our second panelist is Professor Mafani Sohara. Uh, who is at PLAS, which is the University of Western Cape uh, in South Africa. We also have uh, the third uh, presenter, uh, Professor Ruth Wall. As I mentioned, uh, she's the one who is also very concerned about uh, uh, not just here, but also all academic institutions and other research organizations. It's becoming, it's a major issue that we need to be aware of. And she's with the university, she's a professor with the University of Western Cape uh, in South Africa. The fourth panelist who should be joining us any minute from now uh, is Professor Jesse Ribo. He's with the American University in Washington, DC in the USA. So thank you to our panelists. And uh, what I will do now uh, is uh, in the same order, uh, I will start off with uh, uh, Dr. James uh, Mrombez so that yeah, he gives us uh, his only his five minute uh, uh, overview and reflections. Uh, James, uh, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Evaristo. Uh, uh, I, would, I would like to sort of um, look at, uh, at, 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 at this question from the perspective of um, climate change, because this is what uh, I'm currently engaging with. Uh, and my starting point is that uh, what has happened since the uh, declaration of the pandemic by the World Health Organization way back in in, in, in March, February, is that you have actually seen a pause on anthropogenic activity. 
uh, which has resulted uh, in very visible uh, recoveries in nature, in the atmosphere and so on, as a direct result of the decrease in the amount of emissions into the atmosphere. Or to put it differently, capitalism is more or less say, on hold. Uh, as a result of this say, anthropos, uh, there's a general recognition uh, uh, among uh, the, 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 the citizens of the world, to put it that way, that in fact, there is this link between our activities as human beings and what is actually happening in the atmosphere. Now, we all recognize that in fact, uh, this recovery uh, is going to be very temporary. The same thing happened in 2008 during the um, financial crisis. Uh, and, and, and we saw immediately after the crisis that in fact emissions actually shot up as economies started recovering. Now, the important lesson of COVID is that uh, perhaps we could actually have an opportunity to redesign how we govern the atmospheric commons in line with the recommendations that have been made by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and other scientific observations. In other words, it's a real opportunity, firstly, to link the reduction in emissions to specific human activities. But secondly, it's also an opportunity for us to think about how we can put in place institutional and other mechanisms to ensure that this reduction is sustainable. However, there is a major challenge here. The challenge is that the main governance mechanism for addressing atmospheric pollution is the Paris Agreement, which is a unilateral, uh, I mean, a multilateral uh, mechanism where parties to the agreement, in fact, have agreed to put in place certain actions. The Paris Agreement, since it came into effect in 2015, has actually not resulted in any reduction in emissions. In fact, the contrary has happened. Since 2015, emissions have been increasing. The major reason for this is that the Paris Agreement itself is actually a voluntary mechanism. The operating principle of the Paris Agreement is enlightened self-interest. This is to say that nations are going to increase their ambition to reduce emissions to the extent that they see that their actions are going to address their own self-interest, but that also that their actions are going to elicit similar actions in other uh, nations. But this has not happened. And what this means, in fact, is that therefore, the institutional mechanism for regulating emissions <clears throat> that we are working with is inadequate. So there's an opportunity during this COVID crisis for us to review this institutional mechanism and put in place alternative mechanisms to govern how we re relate to the atmospheric uh, uh, commons. But the second sort of a potential weakness of enlightened self-interest is that it could, in fact, result in individual nations taking what we could call Faustian choices. That is to say that, for instance, if one country sees that jobs are going to be at stake as a result of their climate actions, as a result of enhanced ambitions to reduce emissions, they could actually pull out of the whole agreement and decide that their national self-interest takes precedence. That choice, of course, is going to be effective in terms of reviving employment and so on in the short term, but in the long term, it is going to result in worse outcomes for the atmospheric commons. In fact, it has already happened before without a, a, a COVID crisis, right? We have seen nations withdrawing from the Paris Agreement uh, because they wanted to increase the, the possibility of maintaining current economic activity. If you recall President Trump's byline when he pulled the US out of the Paris Agreement was Pittsburgh and not Paris. In other words, the, the, the priority for the US economy then was to protect coal-linked industries in Pittsburgh rather than to continue with their membership of the Paris Agreement. But it's also happening currently in China where in 2020 alone, as part of the Chinese response to the COVID impact, they have actually licensed seven new coal plants when in 2019, the Chinese government had undertaken to stop licensing any new coal plants. And this is likely to have cascading effects to other nations that are producing and selling coal and so on. 
So there is a very real possibility that the COVID-19 is, is telling us that we need to maintain this reduction in, in emissions, but that in fact the recovery is going to be an increase in emissions and that the mechanism to regulate emissions is not going to be adequate. So this is my pitch that we really need to look at the existing mechanism for governing the commons and ensure that it is institutionally effective and that we have mechanisms to uh, implement the existing regulations. I'll stop here, thank you very much. No, thank, thank you very much uh, uh, for your, uh, your pitch. And uh, I think there are a number of uh, issues that we'll get back to uh, and, and follow up on those uh, issues. For now, uh, I would also want to take this opportunity to welcome uh, Professor Jesse Ribo, who has now joined us now. And uh, he's, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, he's with the American University uh, in Washington, DC, uh, USA. And uh, as mentioned at the beginning as well, for those who have just joined us now, we also providing the links to their individual websites so that you can get more details on our panelists. So our next uh, uh, panelist to present is uh, Professor Mafani Sohara. Could we have your, your five minute pitch, please? Over to you. Thank you very much, Evaristo. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, my other four, three colleagues for this webinar. I want to propose three issues or aspects that uh, have implications for, for commons uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19. First, I want to look at what I'm calling a higher level, uh, and then I'll look at what I'm calling local and the uh, lower level, and then probably does the COVID-19 pandemic actually offer us opportunities for resolving or solving some of the issues that have been underlying in terms of commons in Africa. So at a higher level, what we can also recall is that within a space of a month or two in March, April this year, all air travel was suspended with huge implications for Africa, which depends on foreign global tourism, even domestic tourism came to a halt in most countries due to full or partial lockdowns that suspended most economic activities. So abruptly, what we saw or what we have seen is that most hotels, guest houses closed, domestic travel was curtailed only for except or except essential travel. For example, here in South Africa, you cannot travel interprovincially unless you have got a permit at the lockdown five, which we started with, although even now at lock, uh, lockdown three, you need permit. So national parks and the beaches where uh, people flock were closed. And the, what the implications are for this is that most people employed in these tourism uh, related sectors and other tourism value chains lost jobs and sources of livelihoods. For example, a lot of people in local areas where tourism takes place sell crafts tourists. This was not there anymore. And it is forecast that it will take years, if ever, if ever, to get back to the normal levels of tourism and number of people uh, or levels of jobs that the sectors used to support. And there's also been loss of resources and personnel for effective management of natural resources as a result of suspension of tourism. So a lot of uh, resources for managing um, parks and uh, um, reserves depend on tourism. So if this is not there, it has got huge implications in terms of uh, management of tourism. At a local level, i.e that in, in rural areas, those that lost jobs in urban areas, in most instances, return to rural areas, may, uh, resulting in increased pressure on natural resources, both for direct consumption and also as they have resources to use these for uh, income and the uh, livelihoods. Also, we need to 
understand and also realize the loss of income from community-based management, joint use, and ecotourism programs such as campfire, adamant, or conservancies in Southern Africa. So these are some of the issues that we need to, to debate and uh, talk about. But does the, the COVID-19 pandemic, does it offer opportunities? Some commentators actually have argued that the pandemic offers opportunity to redress and look at the way uh, equitable access, uh, inequitable access and sharing of benefits from natural resources is occurring at the moment. They are saying that from now on, we need to get a better deal for communities from, for example, ecotourism programs and national parks and game reserves, which most communities live next to door to. Some also have commented that the closure of parks and game reserves has actually provided respite for wildlife and uh, to recover. So like James has just uh, indicated about the, uh, the reduction in the pollution, what people are saying is that there's been increased uh, recovery of species and, and biodiversity in these areas. And also in urban areas, this also offers opportunity, for example, for governments to deal with issues of infrastructure and equitable um, 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 sharing of resources such as water, which is key when it comes to dealing with COVID-19. So where quality and quantity of water has been an issue for years in urban areas, governments can now have it a, 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 an opportunity to deal with these issues and uh, uh, try and resolve the issues that have been outstanding. So these are my points that uh, I wanted to, to make. They're not exhaustive, but uh, they can uh, and also provide us with the entry points where we can uh, debate and uh, discuss some of the issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mafa. And we'll be coming back to you, especially when we come to the issue on discussions, trying to link, especially with uh, fisheries. Uh, for, for example, we'll be following up uh, in our next uh, round after everyone, everyone has finished their, their pitch. Now we move on to Professor Ruth Wall. Uh, as I said at the beginning, thank you. Uh, it's not a man only panel. Uh, welcome, Professor Ruth, uh, Ruth Wall. It's your turn now to give us your five minute pitch. Thank you. Thanks so much, Evaristo, and to the organizers. Um, so I'm somewhat less upbeat about um, inter the international governance commons right now. I think that um, while perhaps global capitalism is in crisis, so too are the institutions of multilateralism. We see this with the US walking out of the WHO. And I think that while the global system teeters and many people's uh, inclination is towards creating much more local solutions, local economies, um, national sovereignty. African governments are talking about export bans. Um, there's a danger also that this shift towards um, economic localization has a political localization as well. Um, we're seeing shifts towards much more parochial exclusionary, xenophobic, and authoritarian types of popula uh, populist politics in many parts of the world. So I think that that's one issue to be aware of in our wider political context. Uh, one of the questions we're being asked in, in thinking about this webinar is about the African context and whether appropriate responses have been taken. And I think that one of the key points there is about the nature of um, a very useful population in Africa, unlike many other countries that saw an early surge, such as say Italy or, or the UK. Um, and is, have our government's response measures been appropriate? There's a huge debate around that. But clearly the nature of livelihoods, the nature of settlement patterns and the useful nature of societies raises questions about whether it's either possible or advisable uh, to have hard lockdowns such as we've seen in South Africa. But equally, we are countries without strong social protection. That's another failure of the commons in many of our societies with strong public health facilities, without strong public protection. But if I could just focus on three elements of what I see as implications for the African commons, 
focusing firstly on land. So clearly land as a common property good within Africa is such a central uh, and important part of livelihoods. And I think that what we've seen in the early stages of a lockdown is the closure and withdrawal of the central state in many countries. At the same time that perhaps new conflicts are emerging, we're hearing about large numbers of people migrating, as Mafa said, back to rural areas, uh, existing, pre-existing conflicts um, re-emerging in a context where the state is relatively invisible, especially the central state. And so local institutions, the kind of decentralized um, uh, institutions that many people in this network have been working on for many years, their role had, becomes even more crucial. We are thinking that um, uh, firstly, we expect um, uh, on the one hand, a combination of new kinds of conflict, the increased importance of local and decentralized forms of governance, but also the great possibility of distress sales um, as economies uh, founder and as people uh, seek to, to realize some value from, from resources. So there's possibility of, of significant, significant changes in access to and use of land. A further issue I think we should be looking to is the question of the next wave of resource grabs. Because we can be sure if we look, think back to the crisis of 2008, that when global markets and global confidence in uh, financial markets and commodity markets, when all of these are shaken up and now even more profoundly than in 2008, these crises, crises produce surplus capital. Surplus capital that is marching around the world looking for new investment horizons. So uh, James has said, well, maybe capitalism is taking a pause. Well, I think capitalism is re-strategizing right now. And so we should be aware of and thinking about ways in which the African commons will be implicated in the next wave of frontier uh, investment and frontier grabbing. So let's think about this uh, and what's been happening over the past 10 years or 12 years between these two crises. And one, of course, is a major moment of enclosure of the land, of the water, of the forests. Um, and I think that one of the significant things there is that we've seen not only big corporate land deals often backed by governments, but also a lot of the defense of community land rights has taken the form of various types of formalization. And these types of formalization, in turn, are a route to um, to making visible and legible informal and customary forms of tenure uh, that make them susceptible to recordal, but equally to transactions. And so I think that what we're seeing is not just formalization and enclosure of the commons from above, but incremental processes that are having massive impacts on the ground. So in this context, I think the crucial thing is what's been happening over de the past decades, but also particularly in the period between these two crises and the question of who has some kind of safety net to fall back on what role can the commons play in a crisis like this the second thing i wanted to mention is food now perhaps although we think of food primarily as a commodity in its commodified form um, there is a question when when crises hit when people lose incomes um, when livelihoods are massively disrupted at what point do people demand the re-socialization of privatized commodities like food? Now, it's striking that in the first few weeks in South Africa, at least, there were, there were sporadic um, uh, episodes of food looting. Uh, but in fact, large-scale food riots have not uh, emerged, interestingly, um, despite evidence that, that people are starving. I mean, children being admitted into hospital with malnutrition, are, these figures are, are rising. So on the one hand, uh, there's clearly a crisis with, with privatized and commodified forms, and yet the politics to demand the re-socialization of these commons is not finding very clear expression right now. At the same time, there has been enormous outpouring social solidarity, I think partly across the whole world, but also in a certain society, certainly South Africa being um, about the most income unequal society in the world. There's been enormous social solidarity with community action networks linking uh, suburban communities with low income communities and transferring food, money and protective equipment to poorer communities. But you know, at this point, we will face the constraints of social solidarity and we need the state. 
Um, in that context, I wanted to say that I think that there are some certain key ideas and principles that are being bedded down in this crisis and, um, and could lay the basis for a more just recovery. But whether or not that materializes is in a sense up to us. The first principle is that social solidarity is the basis for defending and broadening the commons. And I think that we're seeing forms of social solidarity around this particularly expressed around food. The second principle is that, well, we're seeing how fragile our states are, but also uh, I think the crisis is exposing the need for the state and the need for the state to come back in. In a sense, it's telling the lie to neoliberalism. I was struck by um, uh, the sort of memory, uh, the memory of Margaret Thatcher who proclaimed that there is no such thing as society. Well, I think it was the 29th of March there was a headline with Boris Johnson saying, there is such a thing as society, says Boris Johnson from Bunker. Well, yes, clearly. And then he went on to be treated in the NHS. So suddenly this idea of um, that neoliberalism uh, touting atomized individuals in a shriveled state, that this is going to deliver us, well, it's not. Um, and so I think that we're looking at a moment of firstly recognizing the crucial role of social solidarity, secondly, the absolutely crucial role of bringing the state back into basic provisioning for human life. The third principle is refocusing on our tax base as a commons and the need for basic protection uh, in a context where in many of our societies, um, deriving your own livelihood, developing your own form of self-employment, uh, being in the informal economy, that these means of generating a livelihood have been criminalized. And we saw it here with, um, for instance, formal corporate food value chains being protected while the informal sector was locked down. So uh, what we've seen here is for the first time, the extension of social grants uh, to, to, um, to uh, able-bodied adults for the very first time. And the fourth key principle, I think, could be about reclaiming the natural, uh, the commons of the natural world, land and water. Shack dwellers are saying things like, if you prevent us from working to derive a livelihood and you won't pay us sufficient social grants to be able to live, then we will occupy land and start planting in and around the cities. So, you know, the, the state has been dithering around uh, food parcels and so on, but actually um, the most basic form of social solidarity now is about protecting people's right to acquire and where feasible to grow their own food uh, through reclaiming the commons. So I think that those are some first issues that I would um, point to. Uh, uh, an additional point is, that, is around commons and mobility. Now, what we've seen very firmly in the past couple of months is the entrenching of national borders across Africa. These artificial boundaries that have a long history of their own have suddenly become key ways in which states organize their responses. We close borders. Uh, in some cases, uh, as Mafa says, we even close provinces. Uh, and yet, of course, cross-border trade is so key to livelihoods um, and migrant labor. And of course, lockdown has enormous impacts on pastoralists and people who rely on mobile access to the commons for their livelihoods. So those are some of the ways in which I think we need to be thinking about the Afri African commons uh, at this time. Thanks. You're mute. I can't hear you, Evaristo. I think you need to unmute. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ruth, uh, for an interesting uh, 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 key, uh, key statement. And then uh, maybe this is a good time for us to surge into, uh, you're also talking about decentralization access. And uh, Jesse, maybe it's time we move over to you. Could you give us your keynote uh, before we go into the discussions? Over to you, Jesse my keynote, uh, maybe a few keynotes. <laughs> oh, we can, we cannot hear you, Jesse. I, are you? Okay, I'm unmuted yeah. now. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Evaristo. Uh, and here, I gotta find, there I go, my notes even. Um, and Marco, and it is lovely to see Mafa and Ruth and James 
Um, I am not a COVID expert and certainly not COVID in Africa expert. I know very little bit uh, based on just looking around. I have two eyes and I have a set of ears. Um, but COVID has shown us a lot. I just to take up on Marshall Solon's notion of a revelatory crisis, that's what COVID is. It reveals, it basically drains the water from the lake so that we can see the topography of inequalities and crises that were already there. But this has, has really uh, deepened that. Uh, Jacqueline Soloway also used the concept in 1994 um, of a revelatory crisis looking at drought. Uh, what is shown by these crises are the existing vulnerabilities. Uh, before COVID sort of really kicked in at the very beginning, not before, uh, in March, I wrote a little poem and I'm going to read it quickly. Just to, for those of you who don't know, in the American US system, uh, 1099 is a tax form filed by those not protected by unemployment. And a W-2 is a form uh, by those who do receive unemployment. They kind of reflect class differences in our labor markets. So the poem is just called, uh, COVID Rip the Covers Off. COVID Rip the Covers Off, stark naked, warts and all revealed, precariat, gig workers, 1099 or W-2. We see who's who, who are you, have or have not, hand to mouth. Just don't touch your face. So that's the poem. It's very simple and it's a little ironic, but people are being asked to do the absurd in the context where they're structured into inequality. So what is COVID revealing? What is it revealing that we now need to fight? Um, it's revealing the violent fascists around the world like Trump, Bolsonaro, Erdogan, Duterte, and I, you know, really uh, see these people as not giving a damn about human well-being, but favoring markets over well-being. Uh, but in a certain sense, there's now a kind of pushback, and I think Ruth got to it a little bit, which is that there is such thing as society. The market isn't everything and we're not atomized and it does matter who falls off the cliff. It also reveals that these fascist leaders take cues from each other, no matter how much somebody like Trump is a buffoon and uh, excuse me to buffoons for comparing them to Trump. They are much better than Trump. But uh, what we see is leaders do say things and they matter no matter how ludicrous. And that is that other leaders seem to follow them. As James mentioned, uh, Trump saying Pittsburgh, not Paris, there is a global uh, trend in these leaders uh, retrenching into extremely uh, self-oriented policies that may not be productive in the long run. But anyway, and in fact, you, New York Times today had a piece on, uh, quote, emboldened by Trump's attacks on journalists, autocratic governments around the world are cracking down on independent news sites. No surprise, but COVID makes it all the more stark when media misinformation like Fox News here in the US are killing uh, people. These are sources of mass, um, mass murder, I would say. Uh, we're seeing the shortcomings and misstructurings through all of this of democracies as well, in which there's no balance of power to speak of, despite that constitutional framers intended there to be. And I, I think this is something that is harder to address, but I think people are beginning to talk about, at least here. These things need work. They're part and parcel of stark vulnerabilities. Um, uh, at macro and micro scales, and they are revealed. On the continent of Africa, I do think we also see a great deal of vulnerabilities re revealed. As my colleagues 
have shown in this discussion. We see weaknesses in the international system, as Ruth mentioned, uh, an internationalism that pushes toward localism, which may not be feasible in this more integrated world, but decentralization here, it's, it's too big a discussion to have here. Uh, COVID has, I think, caused a, a sort of pushing of responsibility toward local, but without resources. That's not feasible. We see a lack of social security and protections, which I've observed across the Sahel. And this is, you know, just an example would be that there are free veterinarian services, which now are being sold by veterinarians who are paid by the state, but are selling their services at market prices, despite that they're supposed to be free. The food aid system is also um, being marketized informally, and these are uh, very destructive things. And in times of need, that's when we see this. Uh, we're seeing risks of violence and unaccountable police. We're seeing this dependence on tourism that Mafa mentioned. Uh, clearly, markets are not going to save us and will not save nature when people stop paying. The dependencies are part of a deep vulnerability that, again, you know, I'm all over the place with this, but uh, again, I just want to bring these up because I think what we're seeing is that there's an entrenching uh, of division, uh, governments of the North shirking on responsibilities and historical relations, hoarding protective equipment, you name it, and hunger. Uh, again, something Ruth mentioned, hunger without rebellion. It's an interesting thing to observe. When will this moral economy kick in and how do we uh, play a role in making that happen? So what is vulnerability, right? It's a predisposition to damage. The fixes are not technical, but economic and social, political, economic and social. Watson Bola said long ago, empowerment is the ability to shape the political economy that shapes our entitlements. That is our security and our vulnerability. Citizenship, as opposed to being a subject, a la Mamdani, is the ability to influence those who govern us. This is lacking. Empowerment is the ability to shape the political economy. This is lacking and it becomes visible as autocrats rule in ways that favor markets over well-being. Uh, entitlements are failing while people are uh, ha have very little sense that they can influence this political economy. And what we're experiencing is more than an entitlement failure. It is what I'm now calling an access failure, where access is the ability to benefit, entitlements are the things from which we benefit, which give us security, and people do not have access to these things and are suffering. And we, we see um, are generalized, what we're seeing are generalized access failure. So let me end very quickly here with another poem written the same day as the one on revelatory crisis, but ending on a positive note of democracy, uh, which I think is where we do need to go with this crisis is bringing it back in as Issa Shivji has also uh, pushed for. It's called Strange New World. I don't think June will come this year. Flowers will bloom, schools will be out, a quiet will fill the air. In our boxes, linked by the new luminiferous ether of the internet, now governed in our private spaces, new classes suddenly revealed. There are the secure in their houses, in their houses, the precarious, precarious, wondering what's next. Those beyond the internet, free of the new surveillance, beaten down by the old, they won. We have been individualized and stored for when we are of use. Back to jobs we will go. The gears will soon turn again. Too soon. <laughs>
the precarity of life will shift to the gig and the factory floor. Replicable is the worker. One more takes home a cough. In comes another from the next unit over. Time to wash our hands and open our eyes. Regroup, stay clean, stay healthy, stay free. Rise up to reform. Reform. Take back democracy. Thank you. That is my contribution to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesse, for uh, an inciting uh, uh, presentation and also maybe uh, your poem as well. In fact, I had it and maybe we'll also share uh, the poem, if you don't mind, uh, uh, in, in the link. So we'll probably say thank, thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, I think there are a number of sort of a number of themes which are emerging, uh, especially as we respond to the uh, COVID crisis and even Part of it, I think most of, most of you, maybe in different angles, you have alluded to the issue of democracy itself and the role of the state, uh, especially when it comes also to defining uh, uh, the commons. I have a number of follow-up questions and uh, which links to, to the opening statements that you have made. Uh, specifically, maybe I could start off with James. Uh, James, you are talking about things getting much better now uh, in terms of the climate science, in terms of the climate knowledge that things are getting much, much better. And we know that for the African uh, countries, they've been collectively coming together as a unit. But if you look at what Ruth was saying and what uh, 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 also Jesse mentioned, that uh, you are seeing that people are becoming more concerned about their own interests, what you call the Faustian approach, where people are more concerned about their individual interests. What does this do in terms of uh, the African position in negotiating for climate change, do you think they will sort of collectively uh, come together? Because the idea was to try and fight the hegemony uh, from the northern uh, countries by coming collectively. What does that, that do in terms of uh, uh, all states starting looking inward and uh, maybe thinking about self-interest first and not maybe trying to look at collective action to address maybe collective commons such as climate change and even transboundary resources as we also had, I think, Kemafa mentioning as well. Yeah, um, so uh, Evaristo, I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, things are getting better necessarily. My point rather was that uh, the, 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 the pause in anthropogenic, in, in a negative anthropogenic activity uh, has demonstrated that in fact it is possible to reduce the impact of human activity on the atmospheric commons. However, I also said that uh, our expectation is that uh, if or when this pandemic is over, we can expect that there is going to be a spike in emissions, which is going to lead us back to the situation we were in before the pandemic, when in fact what we really want is to begin to explore opportunities for building back better as uh, uh, my colleagues on this discussion have said. Now, the challenge that we have here is that in fact, the global mechanism for regulating what everyone does with the atmosphere is a very weak mechanism. Uh, and we've heard, for instance, that uh, the, 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 the COVID pandemic has actually demonstrated the centrality of the states over the market uh, as a mechanism to um, support our response to COVID. My point was that, uh, in fact, part of the reason why the state and society, why society has also accepted the centrality of the state is because the COVID response is based to a large extent on science, right? On the epidemiology, our understanding of how the virus behaves and so on. In climate change, the opposite is in fact happening. There have been incredible attempts to discredit climate science. And what you actually need now is to demonstrate how climate science can inform uh, a state-led response to regulate the human behavior that actually causes uh, emissions, that is negative impacts. If we in fact accept that the state is going to play a leading role, then we also have to question uh, 
the centrality of markets in designing the climate response. By and large, the current climate response, in fact, assumes that you can create carbon markets, you can create artificial commodities, uh, carbon dioxide and so on, and use those artificial commodities to regulate the amounts of emissions that we have. So what we need to do is to actually promote climate science and ensure that our responses are based on climate science. That's the first. The second issue is how do we ensure that, in fact, the multilateral mechanisms that have been developed to regulate the, uh, the pollution are effective. And my point is that the current mechanisms in the Paris Agreement, which are based on enlightened self-interest, are in fact not sufficiently effective and cannot be effective. So the lesson from the pandemic has to be, how do we ensure that in fact, we go back to the original principle, which was on common but differentiated responsibility. And here I want to take a point that has been made by all of my colleagues, that uh, the impacts of COVID-19 are unevenly distributed and in fact actually demonstrate the different vulnerabilities that already exist. Climate change is exactly the same. Although the atmosphere is global, the actual impacts of climate change are also differentiated and unevenly distributed with the most vulnerable suffering the highest consequences because of their inability to adapt uh, to climate change. And yet the Paris Agreement in fact puts equal responsibilities for adaptation and mitigation on both the emitters and the victims of emissions. So what we need is to actually revisit that principle of the agreement and put in place a mechanism which recognizes responsibility and allocates uh, responsibilities as well as resources in order to resolve the crisis. So that would be my response to your question. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, James. Maybe at a later time, I'll come back on the issue of science because you were mentioning that uh, uh, climate change is being led by science. And uh, if you look at COVID, you also look at science and how the science which has been applied in the context of Africa has largely been imported uh, without any uh, sort of adjustments to the local context. But I'll pack that one for now because you mentioned even on the issue of uh, differential impacts uh, of COVID-19. You can have the same COVID-19, but you have differential impacts. So maybe I could want to link this with what Ruth was mentioning in terms of uh, uh, the differential impacts of, uh, of, of COVID uh, and addressing issues on gender and uh, even youth. How is this played out in terms of uh, uh, that we might be experiencing the same uh, COVID-19 in the same country, but uh, the impacts are differentiated. Ruth, would you want to address that so that it connects with what uh, James has uh, uh, mentioned on issues of vulnerability? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so, I mean, clearly, uh, I think that I, we're probably on the same page about perhaps a revelatory crisis. Um, I had sort of used the image of like sort of appealing back, like we can see what was there already, but perhaps exacerbation of existing inequalities. So, um, you know, I think that in crisis, the relationship between production and reproduction shifts. And we know that in, <laughs> across all our societies, social relations of production and reproduction are highly gendered. They relate to class, they relate to age, they relate to race, they relate to ethnicity. So, you know, I think that we're in a moment where in crisis and with the crisis of production, we're, uh, we're in a reproductive squeeze and a reproductive squeeze is a gender thing. It is one in which care for family, a procurement and provisioning of food, highly gendered activities t come to the fore. Um, so, you know, the Journal of Peasant Studies was uh, circulating a, um, a, an amazing painting that had been uh, produced uh, for, for one of its special issues. And it was an image of boats on a choppy sea. And of course, we definitely are all in a choppy sea right now. But the caption of this is, we are not in the same boat. And there is the big ocean liner, here is the little fishing boat. We are not in the same boat. We're on the same choppy sea, choppy sea but not, not in the same boat. So I think that um, we know that these inequalities are exposed, but also potentially aggravated. And here's the thing that I feel is the, the question now. We're unlikely to be returning to the same. So either we're gonna build back better or we're gonna build back much worse. Uh, so I see this as very much an inflection point 
uh, the outcome of that inflection point is uncertain. It may be um, more robust, resilient, um, uh, and sustainable and equitable uh, outcomes happen in some areas and in other areas of society, locally or globally, more uh, exclusionary, unequal. Maybe we're going to be seeing a very complex mix. But I think that uh, one of the big uh, questions around uh, which will determine uh, whether or not we build back better is about fighting for not only the defense of the commons, but the reclaiming of them. And there are two particular examples I want to, to particular ways in which I want to clarify that. I think across many societies, one of the divides that's been exposed is in fact data, internet data, the thing that's enabling us to talk right now. This is now key for societies where access to information is the basis for children's education where children can't be going to school. Uh, for some, access to data enables you to continue to work and earn a livelihood like I'm doing right now. It's a way to access information with which you might uh, protect your and your family's health and your community's health. So this has always been a dividing line, but now with mobility limited, online connection is suddenly prized in a whole new way. And I feel that um, perhaps data, the source of which uh, is, um, is meant to be part of a commons, but is in fact privately controlled and sold, is now a new front line for, for fighting for the commons. Not just defending the existing commons, but fighting for the socialization of private, uh, of private, uh, private uh, resources like data. Um, and uh, just a last thought. Um, many people in this network would know that very famous uh, 17th century poem um, I'm also quoting poetry here. Um, okay. uh, in response to the English enclosures, the law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, but leaves the great felon loose who steals the common from the goose. But I had not realized that this famous poem actually has a last paragraph in certain versions of the poem, which suggests a way forward. It goes like this. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common. The geese will spill a common lack till they go and steal it back. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ruth. And I realize that maybe an hour is not what it used to be. We seem to be running quite a, a lot of time and we have a number of questions as well coming in. So maybe what I would do, uh, the next response is if you could be brief, uh, otherwise we'll go a little bit over time. I want to look at Mafa. Uh, Ruth was also mentioning reclaiming uh, the commons, and uh, you area of focus is on um, on fisheries, and fisheries are usually embedded uh, within society. So, what is the impact of COVID nineteen on the resilience of uh, the fisheries uh, in the areas that you are working on, or what do you think are uh, uh, the potential impacts? Since you might not have researched on this already, but what are some of your ideas around this? Thank you very much, Evaristo. Uh, I, I think I just uh, painted a broad uh, uh, picture when I gave my input. But uh, if you go, for example, here in South Africa, when the lockdown began at level five, uh, fisheries was actually uh, categorized as an essential industry where fishing actually continued. But the problem was that uh, when it came to trading or selling the fish itself, most of the small scale fishers, you usually are informal traders, which was not allowed. So they had, they were somehow uh, hamstrung in terms of being able to sell what they catch. And yet, as Ruth has said, uh, supermarkets, so on and so forth, were free to trade as, as they, they went about. Of course, it was rescinded after a, a few weeks, but it had huge impacts in terms of the ability of fishers to be able to conduct fishing and also sell what they fish. Uh, another way you can see it is that uh, when it comes to fish trade, what we have uh, seen in the last couple of years through research is that there's a lot of fish uh, going across borders in Africa, more so in West Africa where fish trade is a huge uh, issue. 
But here, even in Southern Africa, there's fish going across borders, mainly by through informal small scale traders. The closure of borders, for example, in South Africa and across uh, the region, meant that most of these fish traders could not continue fish trading across borders. So this has had a huge impact on their activities, whereas, whereas for whether it's from Zimbabwe to South Africa, uh, Malawi to South Africa, or South Africa. The only people who have been able to continue are formal, the formal sector, ShopRite, uh, pick and pay who who sell uh, canned fish or other high um, high value species of fish which they can easily do uh, without any any problem so this is these are some of the issues that have impacted uh, on on fisheries but also I also said that it, a lot of people who have lost jobs and income in rural, in, in urban areas are going back to rural areas where they are taking up these activities, and this is likely to have impact on both fishing and other activities that they uh, have to they have to rely on when they go back to rural areas. So these are some of the issues that I could relate to in, when it comes to fisheries and the COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mafa. And uh, Jesse, I think it was quite an interesting uh, uh, five minutes of uh, uh, your pitch. You mentioned the issue of regulatory crisis and that it's exposing what was already there, but maybe we didn't see it. But now that we see it, what, what do you think in terms of the context of Africa? And you also mentioned the issue that we, we have most people being subjects and not as citizens. To take it a step further, what should we do to proactively see uh, the former subjects uh, maybe becoming citizens? What are some of your ideas around this, especially in terms of how people could access uh, uh, the commons or natural resource management? Thanks, Evaristo. I, I don't know that I have an answer. I mean, I don't think any of us do, but I think what Ruth said about this being an inflection point is so critical. It's like Althusserian crisis theory. You know, the crisis is when change takes place, but you have to be there to steer it and to capture that moment, to, as it were, uh, steal the goose back. And I think viewing this as a reproductive squeeze is incredibly important. And understanding that socialization, this is a socialization opportunity if we capture it, I don't know. I think I am more frustrated now than I have ever been because how one enters into this political morass right now is not clear to me. Uh, we can do it partly by making the noise we make by talking. And I think that's important. I don't think that's empty talk, it's talk, it's, it's mm -hmm. helping people see what we see. And of course, we saw much of this before the crisis, but it became more plainly visible with it. So my, um, I, I can't answer the question. I do believe that some form of social movement is what we need, the kind of moral economy response to the hunger, to the uncertainty and insecurity that hopefully can be in some way channeled into democratic process so that that is not a violent crisis in the end, but a transformative moment. But I don't, I, I don't know where to go with this. I hope okay. the other panelists have some ideas. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, Jesse. What I could do, uh, maybe with Marco's permission, we might have maybe an extra five to 10 minutes so that we address the few questions that we have. And then I also give an opportunity to each panelist to have one uh, final statement. And uh, I'll just read uh, the questions which have been, uh, uh, which I have now, I think I'll, maybe I'll just read three in the interest of time, I think. The first one was specifically to James, and it was saying uh, what concrete mes message uh, Africa can insist on for the multilateral climate negotiations based on COVID. And uh, uh, it is, the question is expanded to say that it is said earlier that industries cannot be 
uh, or slow down or shut down, but COVID, we saw total lockdown. So it is possible to propose a sort of more nature and less pollution. And then the other question is for Ruth. It says, to what extent are we dependent on the state for uh, responsibility of resources such as food? And do you have any ideas or, or examples on how this responsibility might occur on smaller local scales in a more self-organizing way? And then the last question, I think it came from Tina. Um, it then mentions issues of Ubuntu. How could we use the Ubuntu in terms of uh, organizing as a guide to reinventing politics, organizing the economy and recreating life in society? I think it's quite a long, so I've just picked this uh, brief uh, on that one. Maybe also Ruth, you could also uh, respond on that. If you could be very brief as, uh, as I've mentioned that we are already running uh, 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 over time. And, uh, and then I'll then give uh, maybe uh, just a minute uh, for each uh, panelist just to make a closing statement. Thank you. Uh, Ruth, do you want to go first or James? Oh, Ruth, maybe you can, you can go first, James. And then James will come in. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, um, Evaristo, and thanks to um, all the participants for some interesting questions. Well, I mean, I suppose we need to hold two ideas that simultaneously in our heads, and they appear to contradict one another. The one is the centrality of the state, and the other is thinking beyond the state. And I don't think that we should be forced into a situation of making a choice there, which is, on the one hand, the state as organizer of key functions in society must play a central role. And even when we think that there's the absence of a state, in fact, it is facilitating uh, routes towards privatization uh, and, and capture and accumulation. So uh, I think that uh, we need to think about how to promote the expansion of the commons, the defense of the commons, the democratization of their governance, both through and beyond the state. So that's the way I would frame it. And yes, I think you're, interesting to think about this question of rather than being entirely state focused what are the possibilities for um, socialization of resources like food uh, in more self-organized ways in, in society interestingly about uh, a few weeks ago class uh, held a webinar where we were looking at consumer cooperatives and forms of collective action connecting consumers with small-scale producers and this arose particularly because one of the immediate effects of, of the COVID lockdown is that small scale farmers lost access to their markets, particularly um, niche markets like uh, restaurants and so on. Many of them couldn't travel, transport their goods, whereas corporate value chains were protected. So we had on the one hand, people starving and food parcels not getting to them. On the other hand, we had surplus and, and inability to connect these. And so, interestingly, uh, one project, uh, Tina will be interested, called the Ubuntu Project in South Africa, is forging connections in a moment of food relief to connect small-scale farmers who have fresh produce into low-income communities, and in fact, even uh, transferring seed and fertilizer along with food aid, and finding ways that uh, small-scale um, that urban communities can start to grow saplings and sell back to small-scale farmers. So I think that buying collectively, organizing collectively as consumers and as producers, and building forms of social solidarity from the bottom up has to happen alongside making very clear demands from the state. And I think that a key one is around access and governance of the commons, but also tapping into the tax commons in whole new ways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. James, uh, uh, briefly, would you like to respond? Yes, um, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Evaristo. So just picking up from where uh, Ruth uh, left, from a climate change uh, negotiation perspective, we have to be conscious that uh, post-COVID development still must happen. And I think that uh, the climate negotiations should begin to uh, define a democratized and socialized development pathway, which is in fact responsive to the needs, particularly of the developing nations. The science already tells us how much carbon is required to reach a certain level of development. It also tells us how much carbon has already been produced uh, to achieve the levels of development which have been achieved. So in order to pursue equity in the allocation of carbon dioxide emissions, I think African negotiators should simply be able to put the science before the negotiations and demand a just transition which would allow 
developing economies to expand whatever amount of carbon is required to reach the similar levels of development. That's the first negotiating point. Uh, the second, I think, has to be that uh, already we know that uh, some technologies exist. However, the actual transition to greener, more sustainable pathways, as Jesse said earlier, is not a technological transition. It's in fact actually a reforming of the social and economic system. And we really be need to begin from a climate change perspective, but broader than climate change, to also address the problems with the current social and economic systems in order for us to get on a sustainable pathway. Current negotiations are too focused on technologies and management as the mechanisms by which that transition is going to happen. But I think COVID is telling us that we need to think beyond technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. And uh, I know some of our panelists had other scheduled uh, uh, engagements. Maybe we could uh, start off, maybe I know Jesse he has to be in another meeting. Do you mind uh, if we get um, just one statement, for one sentence from you? You say the crisis is when change takes place and we need to steal back the goose. What would be one of your ideas in terms of how we could do this? Uh, any suggestions on the way forward? Just uh, one sentence and then before, before, before you go. Resistance we'll with you. on every front. I have no big, there's no overarching answer. It's opportunistic. We have to see the opportunities and grab them. And I think this group of people is thinking collectively about that already, whether it be through cooperatives or social movements or through engaging in international uh, politics uh, and institutions as James does. You know, the, the, I, I don't know. I'm, as I said, this is a really deeply frustrating moment because the opportunities are obvious, but the pathways to capturing change are not. So that, that's uh, as much as I will say, but thank you so much. I must run at this very moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, thank you for joining us. All the best in your next engagement. Okay. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe just uh, one sentence each for, for the remaining panelists. As you know, we have already exceeded our own time. Our time. Uh, thank you very much uh, for indulging us in the extra minutes. Uh, and my apologies. There are so many things I wanted to follow up from what you, uh, you all said, but uh, time uh, is not on our side. Just one sentence uh, in terms of uh, how do you see in terms of uh, reclaiming the goose or uh, the way forward? What could be just your one idea? How do we, in, especially in the context of in the context of Africa, should we start off with Mafa, Mafa, James, and then uh, we finish off with Ruth? Just in one sentence, yeah. Mafa does not seem to be ready. Uh, Mafa, maybe we move on to. Okay, and uh, okay, James, one last sentence, and then uh, we'll hear from, uh, we'll hear from Ruth. Uh, Mafa seems to be having issues connecting. Yes, so I, I agree that uh, the COVID crisis has in fact actually demonstrated that we have a crisis of collective action. And this happens at all levels from uh, the global multilateral right down to the uh, local level. So going forward, we really need to begin to strategize around what kind of mechanisms can be available to us in order to mobilize collective action. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, James. And uh, Ruth? I think that this is a time for localizing access and management commons and globalizing our thinking. Uh, so I think that we need to be very careful of the localized uh, uh, sectarian uh, populist politics and I think that the job of people who have the privilege of being in universities like some of us um, our job is to draw the connections connect the dots because as some people a lot younger than me like to say the revolution will be intersectional we need to see the connections and so I, I have enjoyed this conversation thank you so much <laughs>
Thank, thank you very much to our panelists, Dr. James Brombezi, Professor Mafani Swahara, Professor Ruth Ho, Professor Jesse Ribo, who has just left. I think we are beyond our time. Now we are moving. We still have some questions. So in the conversations, I don't know if you could try to respond to some of the questions and the issues raised. Uh, it was quite a rich discussion, but uh, the hour was not enough. Maybe we should have shared it for two hours. Thank you very much. Enjoy. You have a good day, good afternoon, good evening. And before I hand over to Marco, uh, Marco, over to you. Yes, so I would like to say that we can use the discussion forum in the conference to continue this discussion. So the recording, I will, I will post it there and then we can continue some of the discussion because it's, uh, there are indeed a lot of issues that we want to discuss more. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.